Welcome everybody to Clothing Makes the Character. We're so excited to have Nancy Fry and Shannon Babb with us. We don't have any announcements, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Okay. And we managed to miss one third of the panel at the introduction. So why doesn't Gordon start with who he is and what he hopes to bring to the panel? Okay, my name's Gordon Fry. Uh, I've been on a couple other panels already. Uh, I'm a professor of history, adjunct professor of history uh, through Vincennes University uh, campus in Bremerton, Washington, and uh, uh, done a lot, a lot, a lot of historical reenacting over the years. And um, while she deals with the cat, uh, <laughs> I will keep chat- chatting here. Anyway, I've done a lot of uh, stuff, a lot of study and uh, uh, costuming and whatnot. Uh, my specialty is more 16th century, but 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century stuff I'm pretty pretty strong on. Um, it's kind of funny. My oldest daughter, who's really a fashion maven, I said, well, where'd you get this from? She said, I got it from you, Dad. Like, Me? <laughs> yeah, okay. You never know. I'm Nancy Fry, the other half of this dynamic duo. And um, I actually have a BA from the University of Washington in drama, where I basically did costume design and i've been stitching since i was a wee one my mom and grandma both were sewers made up made a lot of our clothes especially our christmas dresses my sister and i always had the exact same christmas dress for years some kind of red plaid taffeta thing every year and uh i got interested in making i've always been interested in costuming i wanted to dress like that cool lady i saw in that romantic historical movie or you know whatever and so i very long convoluted story started out in oceanography and ended up back in drama uh, at the U and have been kind of, uh, worked uh, professionally as a stitcher and costumer for a number of years. And I also do acting and kind of wandered away from it. I got burned out a little bit. Seattle, Seattle, at least in the eighties was a really hot and heavy theater town. You couldn't swing a cat without hitting some kind of theater. So there's plenty of work and, uh, kind of came back into it after I met my husband who who did stuff in uh, film and television, uh, military background stuff. And I kind of got sucked into film and television work. And that's kind of where I am now. (laughs) And uh, my name is Shannon Babb. Most of my costuming happens in the hobby uh, realm. I'm a cosplayer. I specialize in doing uh, period pieces. I love making uh, staves and corsets from scratch. And I go down rabbit holes with uh, various bustle skirts. I am determined this year to make a proper chair bustle um, from scratch. <laughs> like the chair kind that you sit down on? Yes. Oh, like I want to Did make you see the like... Morgan Donner YouTube video? She built uh-huh. one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Morgan, Morgan's hot. Cool. She's fine. <laughs> yeah. She's hot, too. Um, She's fine. I also have some experience on the agriculture side. And so what it takes to make fabric and the all of the steps is something that delights me. Oh, yeah. Um, we are going to be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions or you want us to elaborate on things, please put it on the chat in Discord. Otherwise, I think that we should jump in. Um, And one of my favorite things to do when talking about um, examples of clothing that makes a character is starting out with clothing that totally threw you out of the book. So let's start with some examples of when did costuming go wrong? In a book? In books, in movies, in, in art. Where did it throw you out of the period? I have a book, and I'll bet Gordon's got a movie. Um, my my book thing is just a it's a classic. I'm I didn't start out as a romance reader. My little sister read all the romance novels, and I was like, if it doesn't have spaceships and explosions in it, yawn. So um, I came to romance reading later in life, just as a, on a whim. And I have put down. I have lemmed books after a chapter or two if it was too egregious with the costuming in the in the book and uh and just the, all the material culture but the fun one of the funniest ones 
and I think these were both in the same novel. I don't remember much else about it, but it was a Regency. So we're talking Jane Austen with the high waistline and the very columnar. The skirts aren't very big. They're very narrow, very lightweight, but very narrow, maybe three yards around tops. And she she did something where she sat down and her skirts billowed out and pooled around her. How? How did that even happen? Was she like like Marilyn Monroe standing over the subway wearing an 1860s skirt? I mean, how did this even happen? And the other, oh, there are three things. So there was that moment. And then there's also the, they're at the ball and they're dancing. And it's kind of steamy because he has his hand on the small of her back. And he can feel her through her garments and the heat of her. And this was a later 19th century, so he can feel her through her two layers of gown with built-in boning, her corset, her chemise, all of that. And the corset's got to be probably two layers of, of heavy fat. And he, he can feel her, and she's like, oh, he's touching my back. Honey, you can't feel anything. I speak from experience. I also do reenacting, so... And the third one was the woman gets together another Regency where she gets into the carriage and her shawl gracefully wafts to the floor of the carriage. Her paisley wool shawl floats down like a feather. No, no, no. It would puddle down like a <laughs> waterfall. Those things had weight. So anyway, that kind of stuff drives me nuts. So that's my books. I was thinking of the book that you were telling me about some horrible romance novel where the hero in the Wild West is wearing rawhide pants. Um, <laughs> yes, rawhide trousers. He's a mountain man, so he's wearing buckskin. rawhide. Yeah, buckskin, maybe, sure. A lot of guys wore buckskin pants. Rawhide, not so much. Uh, have you ever seen a doggy chew? That's rawhide. <laughs> yeah, the, mm -mm, no raw, rawhide was used, it was used to lace your snowshoes together because it hardens up to the consistency of concrete. And for the souls of moccasins, <laughs> right. yeah, you bet. Yeah, the rawhide trousers. That book was full of garbage, and that was the funniest. That was in like the first chapter where he comes riding in in his rawhide. <laughs> and actually, there's a film that was very popular at the time. I refused to go see it because it was so egregious to my taste. And that's um, uh, what the hell was it? William Sir William Wallace, the oh, um, Braveheart. Braveheart, because. He he was a knight. He was a gentleman. He didn't wear, you know, overalls. Kilts. He was he wasn't a naked barbarian. He wore the same clothes as the English did. And to have him in a kilt, which didn't actually exist at the time, that weren't didn't come out until the late 16th, early 17th centuries. Bleh. So yeah. anyway, I I'm a snob. I admit it. And one of the things I forgot to mention for my costuming background is I was actually head of the costume department of the largest Renaissance fair in California. Uh, in 1984. Ooh, 1984. Anyway, um, so it was a long time ago, but you know, so I do have a little bit of chops in costuming. And um, I, it, the movie came out a little bit before that, and I was offended by it. <laughs> Painting blue? No, that's a picked thing. Well, not only that, the, the picks put blue designs on their faces, but they didn't just dip their pan in the bucket and smear it. It was these beautiful, fine, <laughs> intricate, tattoo-y sort of designs. They were beautiful. So blah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, there you go. Well, picks. Black shirt. Yes, they're not wearing clothing. In fact, that that was a whole point of the picks. But right. they compensated and made themselves absolutely terrifying yeah. with the designs and awesome. patterning they did. Yeah. Yeah. So we we have your what totally pulled you out. <laughs> What is an example of when they did it absolutely right? What is your, ah, oh, they did it right moment? Hmm. There's actually a fair number of them out there. Can you think of one off the top of your head? I'm, I'm calculating. Why don't you go first, Shannon? I'm thinking. Um, one of my favorites is actually one I'm reading right now. And it's a light novel series called um, Ascension of a Bookworm. They, it's a completely fantasy series, but their conversation about how many how many items of clothing someone has hmm. and the amount of fabric in each, you can the the character as they get to know 
the local fashions can start picking out where someone fits in society on, oh, they have ruffles. That must mean. Yeah. You know how much fabric is in ruffles? Yeah. Ridiculous amount of fabric. Yeah. Um, I don't know why this just popped into my head, but it's the story about the guy with the bombast. Oh, yeah. There's this a- is a this is a fun little detail. If you're writing 16th century fiction, this story will oh, tickle yeah. you. So uh, Janet Arnold uh, has this in, in her Patterns of Fashion in the 16th century. And there was a young man who was arrested in early 17th century England for having too much bombast in his breeches. So for those is- of you who don't know that, you know, the the William Shakespeare, the pumpkin pants, the pained hose. Super. They need some a little yeah. poof in there to make them poof out, and that's called bombast. Right, and uh, super puffy. And uh, this was an era of uh, sumptuary laws in which legally you were only allowed to wear certain clothing, and you could not rise above your station, as it were. You were not allowed to have too much bombast in your in your in your hose. breeches, and um, and you couldn't have certain materials. I mean, this this the idea of. Um, of sumptuary laws goes way, 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 way back uh, and continues fairly till fairly late. But anyway, this young man was actually arrested and brought to trial for having too much bombast or stuffing, which was usually like grain or toe <laughs> or something like that. And he's in court and his defense is, well, let me show you. And he pulls out, reaches in his pocket and he starts pulling out all this linen and he's got his tablecloth and a couple of spare shirts and all this linen that was his clothing and his linen that he'd stuffed in his trousers to to well pardon me breeches to <laughs> puff them out and the judge is laughing so hard at this that he says okay dismissed but just just don't do that anymore yeah, f- find somewhere else to stow your linens <laughs> yeah it was just it's just a wonderful little story um but that's a really good example a historical example of of sumptuary laws uh now that has nothing to do with the question but it's sort of rounded into that um being able to tell a character by their clothing because in virtually any era prior to about 1800 um or even later in different countries you can tell who a person's station by their clothing and by law and that's not just a social thing it's a legal issue and um you can you can t- differentiate characters. You can um, like one of the best films showing that. Although they scatter from you know 150 years in history of the clothing, but um, Pirates of the Caribbean, and it shows w- the the governor is in like 1660s clothing, and the the bosun is wearing like 1810s <laughs> clothing. But you know who the characters are because you can tell it as, at an instant what their position is. Yeah, I like to think of Pirates of the Caribbean as sort of pirate. It's a fantasy. It's a fairy tale. It's a fantasy novel. And even though the costuming, like he says, spans about 150 years, which would not be found in nature, it works for the characters. And it's fine. This is a fantasy story. I finally thought of my uh, a good example of a movie where it anchors itself in the time period and does a good job. and. This movie has a couple of flaws, costuming-wise, but, I, uh, and I'm, this is a pun, I will forgive it for that, and that is the movie Unforgiven, which is the uh, Clint Eastwood Western that came out a couple of decades ago. He and Morgan Freeman and... Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman, <laughs> thank you. Brain freeze. Uh, some, some bad shirts on Morgan Freeman and Gene Hackman. They've got him in shirts that button all the way down opened, which they wouldn't have had in that... Um, Doesn't come out till the 1920s. Yeah, that late 30s. 19th century time period. But uh, what I love, love, love about this movie is the way it visually portrays the prostitutes. There is not one Miss Kitty in this movie. There's not one girl in a showgirl costume, which, yeah, in Paris, awesome. Way out in the Tulies in the wild, wild west. No, a working girl was just wearing a day dress. And they all have corsets and they're all wearing chemises and they're not sitting out on the front porch in their underwear trying to get business because you don't, even if you're a prostitute, you're not outside in your underwear in a corset and chemise in your drawers, which are split in the middle. So, yeah, 
uh, I just thought it was really nice that they just showed regular old working girls in this miserable, dusty town out in the middle of nowhere. And they're out doing their laundry and they're just wearing calico day dresses like you do. And, and what makes them not respectable is they're a little shabby. Their hair isn't great. They may be, they may be, um, maybe showing a little bit of neckline that you wouldn't necessarily show during the day before 4 p.m. if you were a proper lady. Uh, maybe they're outside. Maybe they're not wearing a hat outside while they're doing their laundry, not even a bonnet, not covering their hair. And so there, there are subtle little things that someone who's into costume history picks up and immediately sets the tone and you're there. It feels like it's real. And I thought they did a nice job of that with Unforgiven. Um, and you talked about that other thing. So. Number of costume changes. I know this throws me in both books and movies where I have no clue where these peasants were getting their money. <laughs> but um, <laughs> cost fabric was expensive and hard to make. How many cost uh, how many changes of clothing should we? For example, target an aristocrat versus a peasant. I think the far um, oh sorry. <laughs> yeah. The farther back you go in time and the farther down the social structure you go, the fewer changes of clothing you get to the point where some peasant in the Middle Ages is gonna wear something every day until it starts to fall apart. And he's like, yeah, you know what? My elbows are poking out and my knees are poking out and I've patched it 10 times with this very valuable piece of fabric. And maybe it's time to make a new shirt or not a shirt. Maybe it's time to make a new equivalent of doublet, you know, upper garment, outer garment or a new pair of hose or whatever. He would have probably some under more than one shirt, more than one woman, more than one shift as underwear because that's the stuff you're washing. Um, but if you're super, super poor and you're writing someone who's just super poor right up into the 20th century, maybe they only have one shirt or one shift and, and that your children are, you're so poor, your kids don't even have underpants. You know, I mean, this was a thing. Shiftless. Shiftless. That term shiftless. A shiftless person. But you get, but even up into the 19th century, you had your, if you were, uh, some uh, working for a, a bakery or you were some kind of woman, women did work a lot in the homes, but they also worked in trades too. But you were, you were some kind of a shop girl or something. You probably had one, maybe two day dresses up until, you know, well into the 19th century. And then you had a Sunday best that you literally wore to church or to somebody's wedding or to a party or whatever. And that was, and you might get married in that. That was your Sunday best. Or maybe it's the dress you did get married in, and now that's your Sunday best. Now you're married, and that's your your fancy wear. But you didn't you had under things, but you didn't have a lot of outerwear. I I talked about this in in my um in my underwear panel. Like you say, up until the Industrial Revolution, fabric was expensive, labor was cheap. Nowadays, fabric is cheap, and the labor is expensive which is why we have things made overseas a lot of times. But we, we're used to disposable clothing. Yeah. You can walk into Walmart or Old Navy or whatever and come out with an armload of clothes, and it didn't cost you a whole month's wages. Well, yeah. and people would hand down clothing in wills. That was an important part of uh, one's patrimony was getting the clothes. You know? It's just, uh, that's just the way it was. Clothing was expensive, very expensive. Do you follow Karolina Zabrowski, uh, Zabrowska online? She's Polish. She does costume and hair history stuff. Yeah, the Polish girl. She has a funny one from a couple years ago where it's on YouTubers have these, oh, clothing haul. I just got back from H&M and I got these cool things or makeup haul from Sephora. Well, she did one. It's a clothing haul but it's the 16th century and her mistress died from the plague and she inherited, she's, you know, the maid and she inherited the clothes. Oh, that's new partlet. And it's awesome. It's hardly frayed at all. <laughs> and so, and that's a real thing. Even in the 19th century, you're handing and it, once it's unfashionable and you've run through all the children, then just give it to the servants and they can use it or make it over or make a quilt out of it or whatever, but well, you don't throw it away. And a lot of high households, if you wanted your servants to, to look spiffy, 
you might annually give them X amount of fabric. And then yes. the yes. servant was expected in their spare time to produce the, the clothing yeah. that they would wear. <laughs> their copious free time. <laughs> Well, one thing I wanted to bring out, if you don't mind, is uh, how disasters can change fashion. Um, the 16th century, late 15th and 16th century, and lasted for quite a while, there was the cut and slash or, you know, uh, fashion where you had the, your clothing was actually literally cut up so that the uh, under linens would show. This comes from a, a disaster by... Um, uh, military disaster of the Duke of, of Burgundy, Charles the Bold or Charles the Rash, um, being defeated by the Swiss. And the Swiss uh, were big, beefy guys, and they killed or and defeated all these much smaller Frenchmen who, um, they took all their clothes, of course, and they didn't fit. So they slashed them to make them fit and showed their undergarments. And that became high fashion. Because all these Swiss mercenaries and whatnot, which who were the cool guys of the day, um, were wearing these clothes that um, they just, you know, they wouldn't fit them otherwise. But that became again high fashion, and it started from a very low point, which is you know an unusual way for things to go. But you know, there it is. So Lisa wants to talk fabric. And she just doesn't want to talk basic fabric. She wants to talk the luxury fabrics. <laughs> and this is a really fun time period because they were pulling fabric from all over the world. Mid 1800s, and, upper class. And uh, um, yeah. cotton. <laughs> just the care on this fabric. Almost the care on the fabric is what dictates where it ended up falling because trying to maintain crushed velvet mm. is a pain. Yeah. And you have to have specialized staff to make sure that your clothing looks presentable. Yeah. Although there's a lot of hanging up and airing out. You're not throwing stuff in the washing machine. Uh, a lot of the stuff, you can't wash it. It'll fall apart. Well, there's a problem with dyes, too. And the dyes, yeah. And she's, she's talking uh, mid-19th century, so we're pre-aniline yeah. dyes. We're almost there, but not quite. That's the 1870s. So these things aren't light fast and water fast. So you get some spots on your silk gown. Now you've got spots on your water spots on your yeah. silk gown. So you're going to wear capes and cloaks. So when you're going from your house to your coach to go to that fancy party, you don't want any mist or anything getting on that silk. So fabrics, silk and wool and combinations thereof, um, fine, fine polished cottons, uh, damasks, damasks, which is a cot, uh, fabric with a pattern woven into it. Uh, think, of, think of a fancy linen tablecloth that has a pattern in it. That's a damask pattern. Um, and by the way, silk is a fiber. Satin is a weave. I see this in novels all the time. Oh, and she had, I want only the finest satin. Well, satin implies silk. Today, satin can be made out of acetate, polyester, whatever. Satin is that beautiful, shiny, buttery, heavy, gorgeous, making a bridesmaid's bride, a bride, I can say it, a wedding dress out of. But um, yeah, so silk comes in satin. It comes in Shantung. It comes in Dupioni. It comes in <laughs> Moiré Taffeta. It comes in all kinds of different weaves. But silk and silk is lovely because it's actually quite sturdy. But until you get to aniline dyes, um, especially if you're talking about morning clothes where you want it black, the black dye is really harsh. So a lot of extant black clothing from all through the 19th century has to be very carefully conserved because it was black dyed silk will literally shatter it gets so brittle because the dye has just wrecked it so well, that's and, something to think about and wearing that clothing would eat into your skin yeah you were literally getting rashes and open sores in order to wear some of these yeah. colors now you of course you're wearing if you're wearing your shim even with a chemise on and you would have undergarments under you know cuz people today don't even think about this but you're wearing lots of layers green dye was made with arsenic 
up until aniline, which is the petrochemical based dyes, green to get that beautiful, rich, bright green. It was made with arsenic. And so if you wore that next to your skin without a protection or heaven forbid, you made a drapery over your baby's bassinet and the baby sucked on it. Bye bye, baby. It was this stuff. This was bad. People got sick from wearing green. They what did they call it? They called it green ass, death, or green death, like or acid <laughs> green, or whatever they called it, because um, it was it was it was pretty, but not great for you. But yeah, hope that helped you answer your. Uh, sorry, <laughs> answer your uh, mid nineteenth century questions. But yeah, beautiful fabrics that again. You're, you're washing your under things and the outer wear, you try, if you get a little mud on it, you, you let the mud dry and you brush it off on the hem or whatever. Um, you're not going to the dry cleaners. Well, also you have wool velvets, silk velvets. Oh, yeah. Different kinds of, you know, cotton velvet. Um, it depends Which on your station. velveteen today. Velveteen, but just, yeah. you know, depends on your station in life, what you could afford. If you're you know, fabulously, ridiculously wealthy and, you know, the Duchess of, you know, Northumberland or something, you can afford pretty much whatever you want. If you're one of the servants or if you're like a cowboy or a working girl or something, not so much. But I can afford like a quarter of a yard of of this beautiful fabric or I can afford a few yards of this velvet ribbon or this satin ribbon. So I will trim my middle or lower class garment with the expensive fabric. So I got it on there and I feel, I feel snazzy because I've got this expensive trim or this is, but the whole dress wouldn't be made out of it. You tr like trim it, do some piping or some, some, you know, revers or something. So, oh, and when you wash that garment, because if you're lower class, you unpick yeah. and then re-sew it on every yeah. single time it gets washed. Yeah. So Any that, kind of fancy trims, buttons, bows, fabric flowers, you're going to, if if you're going to, if it's cotton or linen and washable and you're going to, or even wool and you're going to try and wash it. Yeah. All that stuff has to come off. Or and sometimes if you're in Japan and it's a kimono, you take the whole thing apart, unpick all the seams, launder it, and then reassemble the kimono <laughs> well, like, or the yukata. A lot of woolens though were never even washed. No. They were just brushed. You hang yeah. it up and brush it. Or what the Indians would do with uh, if they're like blankets, you know, during the trade era or buffalo robes or whatever got too nasty. They just put it on an ant hill and let the ants eat all the vermin and then shake the ants out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a, a good old fashioned barbarian thing to do. So we have a, a great question on what are your favorite unusual fashion trends that have happened through history? Which there so are some crazy many. ones. I like peas cods, <laughs> the peas cod breastplate, and then there's of course the cod piece, which is wonderful. That's a whole different thing. I like the those peas 16. cod belly. You know, think of your Earl of Dudley. You know, people contemporaneous with Queen Elizabeth, and you look at the men. It's like, boy, they all have beer guts. It's like, no, that was. They probably didn't actually have a drooping no. tummy that was built into the doublet it to make them prosperity. prosperous. Yeah. But the 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 cod piece, of course, is just an absolutely wonderful um, display item. Same era. For yeah, same era. It, it started in the late started in the late fifteenth century when split hose became one piece hose, and they needed something to cover that center portion. And uh, and doublets got shorter. Doublets got shorter. Yeah. And so like, woohoo. And the Italians, of course, thought this was the coolest thing ever. Let's and, decorate it. And, yeah, they <laughs> led the way. I don't, I don't know why it would be Italians. But the Germans, of course, take anything to excess. And they got some really exciting ones. Slash and puff cod pieces. Yes. <laughs> yes. Pull your linens out of your cod piece. That's always for, a good thing. For me, it's a toss up between hair and um, skirt supports. You've got you know, panniers in the 18th century, they get wider and wider and wider till they're just like, you can't go through a door and they're just, they just don't look good anymore. A little bit is one thing, too much is too much. And hair that gets bigger and bigger and bigger till you've got a full rig ship in it. And then, you know, it was the same thing in Elizabethan, the, the, the wheel farthingales, the wagon wheel farthingales where her skirts get white and you could have a tea party on the top of that thing. It looks like a dining room table. And in, in the 19th century, you know, 
the first era of bustle where women looked like centaurs. The bustle was so ridiculously huge out the back or the 1850s where when they invented the cage crinoline and you could make your skirt as wide as you wanted to without having to wear 27 petticoats and it got out of control. So if you're and a good class distinct, distinction there is you can have your upper crust people with full on giant bell shaped cage crinolines in the height of fashion because they're the ladies of the house. Well, they called them Southern bells. <laughs> anyway, Right. And, but you've got servants who then, well, I'm, I'm a servant and I just have this little cotton or linen dress, but I want to be fashionable too. And so they would shove a caged crinoline under there, which didn't really fit under their skirt. And the lady of the house would have to say, honey, no, you're working, you're, you know, you're sweeping the hearth and you're working in the, that's not practical. Please take that off. And I was like, oh, you save it for Sunday <laughs> or your day off, which was never Sunday. <clears throat> Dutch had my favorite. I love the roughs. And how ridiculous yeah. those roughs, but the engineering to construct those. Uh, and it's one of those interesting um, fashion trends. It was gender neutral. Women wore yeah. elaborate roughs just as well as much as the guys did. And surprisingly large swaths of society were sporting these, these collars. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, it started off as just a little rough in the, just a little bit of, over your yeah. collar, you know, on the end. A little of the, ruffle, of and then the it gets shirt, bigger and, and it bigger and bigger, and a separate thing that you tie on. And, and even soldiers, you know, there's a great set of uh, woodcuts by Jakob de Gain, uh, 1607, and it shows all these soldiers with these enormous ruffs, and they're carrying these slow matches which burn everything you know, to set their musket <laughs> off. And he's like, well, there must've been a lot of holes in those clothes. I've done it. <laughs> I put holes in my clothes from my slow match. Yeah. Anyway, not my, I never set my rough on fire though. I was smart enough. Not. <laughs> you wore early stuff. You didn't wear big rough. So, yeah. I lost my ear. So if you were developing a character um, and trying to figure out what they're going to wear, would you design the character first and then work on what they would wear, or would you figure out what they would wear and design the character around it? I would say, and I'm hearing this writing advice in a lot of places, especially if you're stuck with plotting, is build your characters. Build characters that you're interested in. <clears throat> build your characters, and then depending on the time and place where they are, then once you've got your characters developed, then you need to find out what that person would be likely to be wearing. And, and you can play around with that because if you have some someone like, okay, let's go back to the housemaid who's, let's just say she's in the 1850s or 60s, 50s. And she's lower, cat, lower class. She's a working person. She's not an aristocrat. So she's going to have... The simple, she's going to have a few petticoats for a little bit of volume because you did that, but she's not going to be out to here. So her wanting to put a cage crinoline under there, this is a gal who cares about fashion and she, she's trying to better herself. And maybe she thinks she can work her way up the class system. Whereas you could have another character who's like, oh, Lucy, what are you doing that for? That's not our place. And it just looks silly. Take it off. You know, and that's so it tells you something about the different characters. Um, there's there's a, there's a lot you can do. Again, you've got the the prostitutes um, in Unforgiven. You could have, you know, I've some someone who's like, oh, I want to be wearing the latest Paris fashions, and I've got all my gentlemen friends who give me gifts of money and jewelry, so I can so I can have the latest thing. And and she could she could aspire. And of course, fashion developments moved slower before television and and the internet and whatnot. So uh, one thing you can do is. One thing that's nice to do is, again, where and when your characters are. If you've got a gal in 1882 Paris, she's going to be wearing, if she's got some money, she's going to be wearing the latest fashion. Even someone with money and position who's in New York is going to be maybe a year or two behind the fashion curve there. Uh, maybe, maybe a year. Someone in that same year who's in San Francisco, way on another planet over on the West Coast, they might be a couple, three, four, ten years behind the Not fashion. 10, but well, a, a few. Yeah. I, I mean, even when my mother was going to school in Minneapolis, we're from the West Coast, this was in the late 50s, the, fifth, the mid to late 50s. 
Just her going from Seattle to Minneapolis, she felt like she was out of fashion. Because the, the Minneapolis, that was a happening place. That was in the middle of the country, and it was a metropolitan area. And she felt like a country bumpkin because she was from little old Seattle. So it, it's, it's a, something to think about. So how we've been talking a lot about the past. How do we use that to help us try to create fashions for the future? And mm -hmm. one of the things I point out, because I see this a lot looking to the past, people always are trying to make what's fashionable today and incorporate it into the past so it's more relatable. So you probably want to add some aspects that people recognize going forward, even though it drives me nuts because yeah. people have a <clears throat> seem to have a limited scope on um, what they think is acceptable and what they think is beautiful. Well, also, uh, <clears throat> working clothing tends to become a, a, the high fashion, high uh, dressy clothing. To, that's now a full dress item, but 200 years ago, 250 years ago, that was the equivalent of bib overalls. Um, you see that in uniforms, especially military uniforms. Um, right now, guys wear camouflage all the time. That's not the full dress uniform. Full dress uniform is a suit that's basically from, you know, 1900. And that's the full dress uniform, whereas a full dress uniform in 1900 was really elaborate. Uh, and um, so there's a trend towards, you know, I mean, it's, it's horrible to think about, but in, you know, another 50 or 60 years, uh, high dress, dressy stuff is going to be a hood, black hoodie and tight jeans. <laughs> so um, it's it's scary to consider, but that seems to be the way things work. Oh, just yeah, just look at blue blue jeans themselves. Again, when my mom was a kid, if she had tried to wear, first of all wearing pants as a girl, not going to happen. If she had tried to go to school, she'd been a boy and tried to go to school wearing jeans. Her oh. father would have had a fit. Couldn't do it. That's what poor kids. Wear. That's what field hands wear. And her father was a Swedish farmer. So, uh, but yeah, you didn't do that. And then just. You know, so when we see movies that are set in the 50s and kids are wearing jeans, that they're being pretty, that's being pretty rowdy wearing jeans. More, more 40s and 30s and 40s yeah. stuff. But grandpa the, was old fashioned. By the 50s, a uh, little boy in a striped t-shirt and uh, um, and blue jeans was okay, but only a little boy. Right. And not an to adult. church. Yeah. No. And, a, and he's not wearing man, jeans and a t-shirt to church. Unless he's out cowboy and he's not, <laughs> you know, he's not wearing blue jeans or he's a minor or something like that. Uh, and that doesn't really come in until the 60s um, as a fashionable item. But again, that's the working clothes of, of 20, 40 years earlier. Well, look at today. You can wear a T-shirt and a pair of jeans in public and nobody will bat an eye. T-shirts are underwear. Mm -hmm. You, I, The fact that you got a Miami Vice, when did that come out in the 80s sometime? The, the Florida oh, yeah. cop show. One, one of the characters wore like t-shirts with just a blazer over it. And he's a working police detective. That that was edgy. That was edgy. And now we don't, you know, is it a good t-shirt? Fine, wear it, wear it to work, you know, whatever. But, and, but here's, here's another interesting <laughs> thing about blue jeans, for example, is blue jeans started out as overalls. They were not designed to be worn as in and of themselves. They were worn over your wool trousers to protect them. And... It wasn't really until the 1920s and the what they call the denim wars of the 1920s when the the cloth became thicker and thicker that you could wear them as outerwear because they were heavy duty enough to do that. But for hundreds of years, men wore wool trousers, that was what or breeches, and then they would wear a heavy duty cotton or something or linen uh, overalls to protect them. So mm -hmm. and that then that's now that's high fashion. Yeah, even World War II uh, U.S. military uniforms you can find, um, and maybe in Korean War II, you, there's yeah, the there's you can find these these cotton trousers. Well, they're meant to be worn over the wool trousers in field for field wear. So that was a thing. So we're rapidly getting to the end of this panel, but before oh. we go, what resources? 
do you love as far as finding really good examples of either how to construct uh, the clothing, um, what is the right clothing for the time period? What are the resources where you'd go? For, for, yeah, for books, if you're going anywhere from the English Renaissance to the turn of the last century, Janet Arnold, uh, Patterns of Fashion. She has there, she has, she took clothing, opened it up and sketched in detail the construction details on the inside and out and then diagrammed them out so that you can take her diagrams and can reconstruct the, the clothing. And um, in the beginning parts of each of those books, they, they'll talk about fabrics of the day and cutting techniques and things. So, I mean, you can't go wrong. And she has dead people's clothes that she's shown yeah. a pattern off of. Yeah. Right. Let's, you know, let's excavate these, exhume these bodies in Sweden. And, and oh, side, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll just do a dosido. -do. Janet, and in conjunction with that, Nora Waugh, Corsets and Crinolines. She deals mostly with uh, 18th and 19th century stuff, but she, she, uh, talks about a lot of the things that Janet Arnold covers in her books. Uh, there's if there's just there's so much stuff. If you're doing theatrical, the Hunnisett, uh pattern books. I can't think of the names of them right off the top of my head. Calico Chronicle for American frontier uh, clothing. Uh, uh, if you're talking about Tudor and Renaissance stuff in Europe, uh, the Tudor Taylor has wonderful book and they're coming out they've their their first one was details and construction for upper crust people and they're coming out with one that's for everyday folks too so another one from Tudor Taylor I got a whole wall of books behind me why can't I think of anything um <laughs> yeah there's so much good stuff out there and there's so much online right now go to it used to be the costumers Manu manifesto but I think it's costumes.org now which is a great place to start and they will link 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 you to everywhere else on the internet to find out about garment history and there's a ton of great youtubers out there uh, who who go into stuff there's Morgan Donner and there's Carolina Zabrowska and Bernadette Banner, and these are the popular ones right now. Just tons and tons. Uh, uh, J Zach Pinsent, he's in England. This guy lives in Regency clothing every day, and he's a tailor. He sews things from the 18th and 19th century. And he goes into, he has a great rant on Bridgerton. If anybody out there is watching Bridgerton, do not use any of that for your costume research. Bridgerton is a dumpster fire. But... Yeah. I really would suggest if you're going to be writing a character in a particular piece, try to make one of those pieces and actually wear it. Yeah. It will tell you a lot about how to move and how to describe. Clothing sounds different at different yes. points in history. And you get those little nuances that really bring the, uh, if, the readers if in. If you live in a city that has a museum that has a good costume collection, a good historical clothing co collection see if you can contact them and get permission to come in and request a look at some examples from different periods and um, you'll be wearing cotton gloves but just seeing it in person and 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 seeing how it moves and there are more people finding video from the turn of the last century so you can see the women walking in their their eight 1900 era skirts and their hats and how they move there was a question on when did uh, men wear military dress uniforms, basically any ceremony, uh, like when a general is testifying in front of Congress or the uh, Third Infantry at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Those are full or dress to a ball. uniforms. Yeah. yeah. Or to a ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, there you go. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been a really fun panel.